Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. It's beautiful to be here with all of you. Yeah, it's very precious. Yeah, and Jenny went to maybe three months in psychology, heard one lecture and said, this is not for me, and, and I, I was in university for ten years full time. And I think the Spirit was just uh, giving me a lot of symbols of the learning of the world, a lot of vocabulary of the world to use, a lot of symbols so that I could speak and be spoken through with words that I had some familiarity with so that the Spirit could use it. And yeah, of course, the miracles is a, is a very good use of words too. The ego made words, and the ego made words as a defense against the light. In heaven there are no words, there's no need for words in oneness, and pure love. But uh, the ego made the words, and so Jesus tells us that words are symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So much for words, twice removed from reality. So the Holy Spirit uses the words in the Course, and of course through love has been touched by poetry and literature, Shakespeare, Rumi, Kabir, you know, many, many, many great words have been spoken. The, the Greeks, Plato, and the, the Greeks, Socrates, and so forth, and, and I think A Course in Miracles is just a very good use of words, but we have to remember that everything of time is an invention of the ego, and the Spirit just uses the words to take us to a timeless moment, to an internal moment of freedom, of creation, of God. And the same with time, the Holy Spirit uses time to undo time. So, the first thing that we begin to start to understand is that everything that we perceive as our perception of linear time is, is false perception. And it's false because God didn't create it, it's false because it's temporary and God is eternal. And the eternal doesn't really even know of the temporary, but the eternal uh, created another eternal being called the Holy Spirit. And that eternal being is, is referred to in the Trinity as the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. So, people who are familiar with the Christian Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is like the bridge. The Holy Ghost is an eternal being that is capable of, of, of knowing that there is an error, but looking beyond the error to the truth, always to the light of truth. So the Holy Spirit's gaze is just riveted on the truth. The Holy Spirit looks beyond the defiled altar, the altar where something else other than God is, the belief in ego, to the light of truth. And that's why the Holy Spirit is the answer in any circumstance or any situation, because the Holy Spirit does not see the error. And that's the title of our our three-day retreat, do not see error, do not make it real in awareness. That's what forgiveness really is, is do not see error. Because the ego made up a perceptual world of specifics, of fragments, in order to present false evidence appearing real. Fear. F-E-A-R. False evidence appearing real. So the ego invented specifics. There are no protons and electrons in heaven. There are no neutrons. There are no molecules. There are no building blocks that we call building blocks of, of proteins and, and different aspects uh, that make up this world. We have a computer system in the world with, which is used on um, phones now and uh, in watches and computers and everything, but it's a binary system and God is not binary. God is one. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, you know, they start off with, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and might, love thy neighbor as thyself. Those are the first two commandments in the Bible and when Jesus came, he basically emphasized the first two commandments. In other words, mm, ten Okay, helpful. Much more helpful if you just focus on the first two. <laughs> the other eight will take care of themselves. 
And of course, as we know, if we are able to focus on the first one, then the second one will take care of itself. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Because the second one is a literal expression that your neighbor is yourself. Literally, not figuratively. And not in form, because form is specifics, but there's one of us, there's only one of us, so love thy neighbor as thyself is really love thyself, as thy, thy were created. <laughs> you were created in spirit, and you love in spirit, you will only know love in spirit, you will never know love in duality. Whatever you think is love in duality is, is just a, 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 a vague reflection of something that, that can't really ever be reflected in duality. You know, a unified awareness where you see all the symbols as the same, and the light lights up all the symbols of the world equally, that is what forgiveness is. So, forgiveness is really do not see error, do not make it real in awareness. Forgiveness doesn't first perceive a harm, or perceive a wrongdoing, or perceive an error, and then pray to be, for it to be corrected, because if you believe in the specifics, you have already bought the ego's bait. You have already believed in something that God didn't create. In heaven there's no need of forgiveness, because all is one, and forgiveness is unknown in heaven. There's nothing to forgive. In pure love, pure oneness, pure God, uh, there's nothing to forgive. But forgiveness is is the one illusion that leads out of all the rest. So that's why the whole curriculum of A Course in Miracles is dedicated to forgiveness, atonement, and that's why the forgiveness that Jesus talks about in the Bible, he was trying to point to a forgiveness that was beyond human conceptions when he said, forgive 70 times 7. He was giving us 400 and that's, he's giving us a bigger number, <laughs> saying it's much bigger, it's much more than you can conceive of from a human perspective. And that's why the two words I think that Jesus spoke on Sermon on the Mount that were the most profound were judge not. But for the last 2,000 years, plus years it's been a difficult uh, than to integrate for the human race, because the human race cannot integrate. Yet the human race is a projection of the ego. So the human race couldn't integrate those two words. Because it's, a, it's a product of judgment. All of the bodies, all of the, the mountains, the lakes, the rivers, the oceans, the, the stars, the planets, and the galaxies are all a cosmic projection of, of a belief. And that belief is separation from God. So the scientists look back and postulate that there seems to have been a big bang that occurred before the, the gases, the simmering gases of the cosmos at one point were sent in, out in many directions. And some of the gases seemed to cool down into planets. Some kept on burning their stars, <laughs> all kinds of things, quasars, black holes, which strange things happen with gravity. Gravity is nothing like uh, it is on Earth in a black hole, uh, as we've seen from, from what science has shown us in some of Interstellar's great movie for uh, giving us a, an idea of how different gravity is. But, but gravity isn't a constant. And we find that this whole projected cosmos is not a cosmos of constancy, it's a cosmos of seeming change, of movement, of, of differences, and it has no relation to creation, which is purely spirit. God is spirit, Christ is spirit, and the creations of Christ are purely spirit. They're, it's all within the spiritual realm. The creations of Christ are not babies, or tulips, or, <laughs> or uh, insects. There, there is no 
form that is part of creation because spirit creates and spirit creates and spirit. God is spirit, Christ is spirit, and the creations of Christ are spirit. In this world we get apples from apple trees, pears from pear trees, we get peas from little pea plants, pea pods, you know, it, it, the form comes from it. And we get, in procreation, we get babies and children from other humans, from adult humans. The only thing that Jesus does is he'll use in his book, A Course in Miracles, he'll say, yep, that's right, in this world, children come from their parents, but even in this world, the children did not create the parents. The parents created the children. So he says, likewise in spirit, God is your creator, and as the Christ, the pure creation of God, which is your true identity, you are like God in every way, eternal, changeless, perfect, oneness, except for one, and that Christ did not create God, God created Christ, just like parents create children in procreation. That's an important distinction because the ego is the belief that, that you can create yourself. And you not only can create yourself, but you can create yourself any way you want to be. You can create yourself in any size, shape, culture, language, uh, time, period of time. It's basically, create is, uh, is a word that really doesn't fit with the human race, because the human race is, and the cosmos is a projection, but basically the ego is saying, oh, you are an eternal creation of an eternal God. Hmm. But somehow you lost that, you took a wrong turn. Some of you coming here today know, coming to this place, if you take one tiny, <laughs> tiny, <laughs> tiny wrong turn, it, it turns into a detour that lasts <coughs> for minutes, hours, weeks, days. Your car might burn months. up. Your car might burn up. Somebody's car, they took a wrong turn, they went into a very steep, what was it, a orchard or yeah. something like that, and then, which was only meant for plows and things like that, and then literally the car burned up. Oh, sorry, we didn't make it, our car burned up. Uh, one small turn, and then your car burns up. But this, so this cosmos has been described as a detour. It's a detour away from truth. It's a, it's a detour that, that you can give it terms like short and long, or big or small, but a detour is just a detour. And this weekend, this Friday, Saturday, Sunday, what we want to do is use all of our experience together is to come closer to the title of the, the weekend, Do Not See Error, Do Not Make It Real in Awareness. Because as soon as you first perceive the error, you've bought the bait. And as soon as you buy the bait, then, then forgiveness, as Jesus is teaching it, is impossible. If it, because error and, and forgiveness cannot coexist. One sees the false as false. One, the Holy Spirit, sees error as just an error, and, and it's over and gone. It's complete. It's finished. As Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It is finished. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Holy Spirit, that was the Holy Spirit speaking through the man of Jesus. Be of good cheer, it is over. The nightmare is over. The darkness has been transcended. There is only light. There will always be only light. There is no devil. There is no Satan. There is no opposite force to God. Uh, because God is all in all, in all, purely spirit. So we're going to go very deep into looking at what does that really mean? Do not see error. Do not make it real. Because the meaning of that is to come into direct contact with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, again, looks past the defiled altar and only sees the light of truth. The Holy Spirit's one function is to remember heaven, remember God, remember oneness, remember Christ. So the Holy Spirit never strays from that function. 
always, always looking to the light of truth. In, in every seeming circumstance, always just sees the truth, sees the truth. It's, it's a very simple function in the sense that it's only one. And then the ego is very complex, so it makes up many, many, many specifics, many, many functions, many, many options, many, many possibilities. You can see the complexity is like an exploding complexity to cover over this beautiful correction. I always enjoy coming to Europe because um, just like uh, Babylonia and Mesopotamia is kind of sometimes called the cradle of human civilization in the history books. Europe, in, in terms of time, ha has had a lot of things that that seem very, very important in the context of history. Uh, and I think of Europe, I think of Einstein right away, because I have such an adoration for a scientist that sees things in a completely different way than they've ever been seen before. And Einstein is uh, from Germany, and, and most People think of Einstein and his theory of relativity, and the E equals mc squared, and the equation, and all that. But when I think of Einstein and his theory of relativity, basically he, was, he came to a realization that space and time interact with each other, and that they're both relative. They, they interact with each other in different ways. And, and yet they're, they're, in some sense, codependent because they interact with each other and they're, and they're always relative. There is nothing absolute in their interaction. And to me that word absolute is important because if we're going to find God, God is the absolute. And, and truth is absolute and oneness is absolute, and eternity is absolute. And Einstein just basically said, mm, time and space interact in a way, in a relative way, so that there is nothing absolute in their interaction. And, and the whole cosmos is space-time. So he was basically saying that the entire cosmos of space and time is relative. Why would you search for truth in the relative? That's a good question. That's a question I think a philosopher would raise as soon as Einstein makes this discovery. If time and space are interactive and they're relative, why would you search for truth? Why would you search for that which is absolute inside the relative? It must be that the relative is like some kind of mask, some kind of covering some kind of del delusion, some kind of distraction. And it doesn't matter how many years or decades or centuries or even millennium that this error seems to have persisted inside time, because time and space are still relative, always have been, always will be, and there is no solution in time and space. You can't find God in time and space. If we look throughout history, you know, we see like the Tower of Babel. Why did they build a tower in the cradle of civilization? The Tower of Babel was an attempt to reach God. But what's the assumption? That God is above earth or in the sky. So they started to build the highest tower they could build, but the assumption is that God was somehow in the relative cosmos, and if you build a tower high enough, you would go up there, maybe up toward the clouds, and see this beautiful light, and go, ha ha! We did it! We achieved it! We made a tower big enough! And then if you look at throughout history, you see there's so many temples, there's so many synagogues, there's so many churches. That's one thing I always enjoy about Europe is just going on a tour around all the sacred sites and, and, and temples and churches. You can feel the presence of love, but 
What Jesus is saying is you can't bring the absolute into the finite. You can't bring the absolute into the temporary. You have to expose the temporary for what it is with the Holy Spirit's help and see it with the Holy Spirit to realize the truth behind the temporary, the light beyond the images. And the, the main teaching of A Course in Miracles, if I had to summarize the huge book, is that you, you cannot bring truth into the illusion. You must bring the illusion to truth. You must uncover the unconscious beliefs and assumptions you have in your mind and allow them to be raised up to the light of truth where they will disappear. It doesn't work the other way around. Human race has tried that actually for many, many centuries. There's, if you go back to ancient civilization, you can find temples and churches. You can find statues. You can find all kinds of attempts in statues and temples and and all kinds of attempts to reach God through the form. And Jesus is telling us in his course, he said that that is not going to work. In fact, I was referencing lesson number 23 from the Course in Miracles workbook. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. And he has the audacity, the ego would say the audacity, I would say the humbleness, to say this is the only way that will work and nothing else will work. If a human being told you <laughs> this is the only way that will work and nothing else will work, you'd go, ha! <laughs> like, get out of my face. <laughs> get out of my face. How dare you, how, you know, how audacious this, to say such a thing. But, but this is the Holy Spirit speaking through the Course. And basically that's why Jesus was called the Way, the Truth, and the Life. Because it wasn't Jesus the man that was the Messiah, really. It was the Christ presence, the Holy Spirit that spoke through the puppet, that was calling the mind to wake up from the dream of time and space. So, you know, as it says in the Course about Jesus, the man was an illusion because he seemed to have a separate self that was walking apart from other separate selves. It, just by definition of being a human being, a body walking apart from other bodies, that right away disqualifies you from being the Savior. It wasn't Jesus the man that was the Savior, because the Christ is, a, is an eternal presence of divine love that was created by God in divine love. And, and the Christ is not male or female or masculine or feminine. The Christ is pure spirit. And again, you can't bring truth, pure spirit, into illusion. So even that phrase in the Bible that says the Word, capital W, the Word was made flesh in describing Jesus, the Word was made flesh. Jesus says, strictly speaking, that's impossible because he's basically teaching us you can't take something like spirit, you can't fit <coughs> eternity into a construct called time. You can't take eternal life and put it down on a timeline. He, and even call it a Messiah, you know. So, for years, there have been, in different cultures, talks about messiahs or saviors, and the prophecies in the Old Testament was there would be a messiah that would come along and would set the captives free. Basically what that was forecasting was, there will, there will be a puppet that will come along in the land of puppets. <laughs> and this one puppet is not special, but it, it will have behind it a life force we will have behind it a, an eternal love that will animate and use the puppet. It won't go in the puppet. So you don't have to worry that the eternal life could be killed, or how long eternal life will live, because eternal life is outside of the realm of time and space. But for a time, for a period of, of three years of public ministry and 37 years on, on earth, the puppet uh, was used by the Holy Spirit, but Jesus says, and it speaks of Jesus in the Course, and it says, His little 
life on earth was not enough to teach the lesson that he learned for you. In other words, those thirty-some years and those three years of public ministry, that was nothing compared to the lesson that he learned. And the lesson that he learned was that God was real, truth was real, love was real, and the world was not. That's the lesson. <laughs> That's why it's such a big lesson. And a, and a puppet does not learn that lesson. They could say, well, Jesus was the, was the first one to be enlightened. But in the end, puppets never become enlightened. So we don't have to argue about J Buddha and Jesus. Which puppet was enlightened first? Because puppets don't become enlightened. The point of enlightenment is to see that you are not the puppet. You are not in the puppet. You never were the puppet, and you never will be the puppet. <laughs> That's the, the goal of spiritual awakening, is, is transcendence. So, Einstein, with his theory of relativity, you know, was the beginning, at the beginning of the early 1900s, of a group of scientists, you know, again, here we are in Europe. Europe, there's your scientists in Europe, you know, they're, they're wondering what is the nature of things, and, and uh, actually what Einstein and Planck and, and his group of, of quantum physicists will do is they will begin the discovery of quantum physics. And I was sharing recently, when I was in Malaga, that, that if you look at Newtonian physics based on Sir Isaac Newton, England, and then you look at quantum physics, Quantum physics don't carry forth the principles of Newtonian physics. Uh, quantum physics completely eclipse and transcend Newtonian physics. So there's nothing a part of Newtonian physics that go forward once you begin to look into quantum. Once you understand how important that is, you know, you will not look through any Newtonian books. You, uh, Marina was saying, David says, all studies are false, because all studies are based on the empirical scientific method, and, and that was the scientific method that Sir Isaac Newton was using, and his assumptions about the nature of reality and what things were. But all of them are equally transcended in the quantum realm, because when the quantum physicists discovered the quantum field, it was all pure energy, and it was all perfectly interconnected. And they were terrified by it, you know, they were just shocked when they discovered the quantum field, because, um, I mean, even Einstein was afraid of it. I mean, every, everyone was afraid of it. Uh, when, when Einstein discovered the quantum field, it's interesting what he called it. You can always tell whether a scientist is afraid of something by what they call it. So, when they found the quantum field, the, the quantum physicists called this unified field of, that Rumi calls the field. There's a field, I'll meet you there. They called it entanglement. That's, that's the word that, <laughs> that's a very, uh, kind of projecting the human concepts onto the, the field, entanglement. It was, it was scary. And this entanglement was scary, and, and then Einstein said, this is spooky action at a distance. <laughs> spooky. Mm -hmm. When Einstein calls something spooky, he's afraid. <laughs> <laughs> we don't understand it, it overthrows everything we've ever known or believed in the world of physics or the, the world of science. It is spooky. And it's spooky to the ego, because the ego invented the cosmos, and the ego invented, even the laws of physics are an invention of uh, the ego. For every action, there's a reaction. And if you look at all laws of gravity, the laws of thermodynamics, and everything, you will find that most of the field of science is the egos in there. Most of the field of religion, the ego, <laughs> is in there. What part of religion is the ego not into? Christ. <laughs> it's, not, it's not into Christ. What about the rest? Yeah, it's into the rest. It's into all the rest. It's into the theologies. 
It's into the do's and don'ts. And of course the miracles, Jesus says, there will never be a, a universal theology, only a universal experience. He's talking about the Christ, the universal experience of love. He says at one point of the Course, forget this world, forget this Course. Wow, when you dictate a book and then you say in Lesson 189, forget this Course, you have to wonder, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Most authors don't put that in the book. <laughs> they wait till you make that discovery later on, but they don't put it actually in the book. <laughs> Less than one thing, I forget this course. But he's basically saying, come with fully empty hands unto your God. He goes on to say, he's saying, be still and know. Come, come into God. So when I think of Europe, I think of Einstein. And, and, and that's because of, he was like another pointer. He was a pointer. Now what Einstein discovered, uh, he, was right onto it, but then when you talk about transfer of training and putting what he discovered, putting the, the quantum field into practice for human beings, oh, that's something that the <coughs> quantum physicists weren't even prepared for. They, they were scared of it. How do you put the quantum field, how do you come to the quantum field through human relationships? If you ask them, they say, we have no idea. <laughs> We still have struggles in our, uh, Einstein had struggles with his, with his wife, he had all kinds of struggles with relationships uh, and the rules of this world in terms of relationship. He, he was reaching a state of mind with the quantum field that was so high, it was unified, that, that his perception of himself and the world and people, you know, he, they were trying to use his ideas to make atomic bombs, you know, to end, end World War II. And he wasn't so thrilled about the use of his ideas for weapons. Even when he was younger, during the war, when they were using science to make different kinds of poisons and poison gases, you know, first the Germans developing them, and then the British and the Allies developing poison gases to to kill troops on a mass basis. Einstein was like, this is not the purpose of science. But what he had come to was so high, and then it was echoing the, the Vedas, echoing some of the great non-dual traditions that we have in, in human history, but the practical application is where we have Jesus coming with his Course in Miracles and, and giving us the same high, high teaching, and saying, now we're going to work at transferring the training in your daily experience. You have to transfer it to every thing and every one. You have to transfer it. We have to use the specifics that the ego made and practice with the specifics to reach that high state of mind. Because in heaven, imagine if all is one, then what we perceive as this fragmented world, a world of differences, a world of levels, a world of hierarchies, of contrast, a world of duality and multiplicity, uh, all of these kind of hierarchies and different levels that we seem to see are part of time. We break up time into components, we break up space into components, we, we break up different shapes and sizes into different categories, and the ego has given meaning to all of the trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of specifics that it invented. It's given a different meaning to every specific of the trillions of particles and pieces. It's named, if you look at, at this, the night sky, that's what astronomy is about, it's named the planets, and the stars, and the spheres. <coughs> On Earth, we have geographical uh, delineations for different countries and different continents. We have different geological definitions for rock formations, for the ocean, for everything. It's all part of a system of egoic labeling and categorizing 
its own inventions with the purpose of making them real in awareness. The only reason to call a cup, a cup, is for separation. The only reason to call a table, a table, is for separation, or a vase, a vase, or a phone, a phone. The only reason to call a person by a name is separation. There's a workbook lesson where Jesus says, you speak to those who are not there, and those who are not there seem to answer you. I was doing a session back in the 1990s at a suburban house in uh, Traverse City, Michigan, and it was a household where the parents uh, had given over the house to us to use as part of a spiritual community, and we had children living right there, uh, Mandy and Matthew, and we were up in one of the bedrooms, which we had turned into a session room back in the 1990s, and everybody was around. We were going through a course workbook lesson, and and the words were coming out from Jesus. We were reading the words, you speak to those who are not there, and those who are not there speak, seem to answer you. And just as the words were spoken, there was a knock at the door. And we all laughed. As, as one of the parents said, who is it? <laughs> and then one of the children said, it's me, Matthew. Said, it's me, Matthew. And we went, Jesus is giving us a little skit. <laughs> right when we read the sentence, he shows us the most basic of human interactions, greeting somebody whose name you know, by a name, and then that person acknowledging it. It's me. Who is it? It's me, Matthew. That is an interaction that is used by the ego to reinforce separation. It's simple as the most basic interaction between two human beings is all part of separation. So that, just that one thing starts to teach us that the fundamentals of perception are faulty. When we hear somebody speak, we oftentimes are thinking, are they speaking the truth or are they lying? And Jesus is saying, all the words are lies. <laughs> <laughs> because all the words are symbols and symbols twice removed from reality. And now you're trying to pick inside the dream world which are the true words and which are the false words. Which are the people that are telling the truth and which are the people that are lying. You see, he's saying, you're, you are lost in the cosmos and you're trying to pick and choose between the right way and the wrong way. I want to make all the right moves in form. Uh, there was a, an American filmmaker named Spike Lee and he made, he made a movie, Do the Right Thing. That's the title of the movie, Do the Right Thing. And Jesus is saying, well, you better start with think the right thing. Because all of your doings, are doomed while you think with the ego. If you're thinking with error, what does it matter? What the body seems to do, because what you do comes from what you think. And if you think with the ego, your doing is going to be misguided. In some Eastern philosophies they will call that misaction. They call it right action and wrong action, or right action and misaction. But Jesus is saying, no, you can't even solve the equation by right action, wrong action. Do the right thing, do the wrong thing. All morality and ethics are tied up and locked in on that level. And nobody agrees. <clears throat> the religions don't agree, the philosophies don't agree. Everyone's talking and arguing and pointing figures. Uh, homosexuality is a sin. Well, that's a sin. <laughs> Your greedy lifestyle is a sin. Well, you know, and everybody's pointing the finger saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's the realm of specifics, where all there is is judgments. And nobody, no person is right or wrong, because persons that seem to be doing the judging are constructs, are projections of thoughts in your mind. And you can end this whole thing by just unifying your mind with the Holy Spirit. You can end your struggle by just hearing one voice, and only one voice, the voice for, for God in your mind. 
You don't have to try to get into weigh in on your opinion on all the judgments of the world. And with the Industrial Revolution and now with the advertising revolutions on the world, and now we have we've had in our generation the social media revolutions where now it's an explosion of images going out. Layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of specifics. And, and then you, you're supposed to ask the question, what is truth? Jesus says, hmm, thank you for asking that. <laughs> They're watching an explosion of images that seems to keep exploding more and more and more and more. And, and to ask what is truth is really to say, I, want, I need to go inside and be still and commune with the spirit within me that knows the truth. Because I'm lost in time and space while I'm trying to interpret these images. There's helpful interpretation, and that's the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the present moment, which is none of the forms are real. They're all equally illusory. And then there's all the trillions and trillions and trillions of interpretations, which we could call personal interpretations. Where somebody's talking to somebody and then they say, in my opinion, you can just stop. <laughs> in my opinion, stop right there. I'm not interested in any more opinions. What do you mean? I'm, I'm in it for truth. <laughs> truth? What's truth? Whose truth? The truth. <laughs> I want the truth. I want the one truth. But that means I'm going to have to be so, so humble and so much willing to let go of the self-concept, of the self-image. Because the ego has made the body self, it's made the personality self, and it, it depends on the mind identifying with that personality self, so the ego stays active in the unconscious mind. It, it cannot stand the light of truth. If, if truth if it's brought to the truth, the ego disappears. But if it's, if it's hidden underneath the lies of many images and forms, then the ego stays hidden. So the ego is kind of like smiling in the back of the mind. Almost like a, if you had a, a well. Uh, we went with Javi to this ancient, it looked almost like a well, it was so deep, because there was water in it. But you can imagine like a very deep well that's so deep that it's very dark, that, that sunlight doesn't get down into the deeper aspects of the well. And at the bottom of this well, on the bottom, the very bottom of it, we'll say it's a dry well, at the bottom of the well lives a spider. And the spider lives in the dark. The spider needs the dark. The spider cannot live in the light. It just lives down there. And at some point, you start to realize that this spider is running this whole cosmos. It's, it's in the dark, it's hidden, it's out of awareness, it's unconscious. The spider is running the entire cosmos. It's moving the planets and spheres, it's moving the bodies, it's, it's running, running the table of the whole cosmos. So at some point, you get interested in the spider and uh, uncovering the spider. And you take a flashlight, and you shine the flashlight down. But wherever the beam of the light goes from the flashlight, the spider will move away into the darkness. It cannot stand the light. So you shine it down there, it moves. It sees the light coming, it moves to the other side of the, of the dark spot. You shine it around, you move it, it moves away, always it can't stand the light. So finally you go get one of these big searchlights. <laughs> and you put it on top of the well. And you go, clink! <laughs> and the spider goes, <laughs> Because that's like game over. If, you're, if your whole game is hiding, and you have a spotlight going down the well, it's a very strong spotlight. That's like the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's like, gotcha. I, I see you. <laughs> and you're not real. <laughs> it's like, ah! 
<laughs> you see that so spiritual awakening when all the fear comes up that Chenny was talking about, the fear of the light. The fear of the light is the fear of the loss of individuality, it's the fear of loss of personality, it's the fear of loss of memory, of pests and projected into the future. It's, it's the fear of loss of everything that the ego made. And when the ego invented the cosmos, then its purpose of inventing it was to get the mind so lost and so addicted and so immersed in the images that it would never think that there could ever be anything more than, than the images. And that's what spiritual awakening is. So the implications of quantum physics and the implications of Jesus is teaching in the Course when you start to transfer the training to everything and everyone, without exception, then you start to, it starts to feel like a dismantling of your world, of your perceptual world. And this dismantling of the ego's world is, is the dismantling of the false self. And, and the ego will interpret that at every turn, like something's wrong. As you start to feel like you're becoming a little bit disoriented or, or confused because things are not what you thought they were, things are not as they seem, as you start to go like in the, the down the rabbit hole, we'll, we'll say, like, like uh, the famous you know, Lewis Carroll story, when you start to go down the rabbit hole toward the light of truth, then it seems like in the ego's interpretation, like your world is falling apart. One of the first stages of the development of trust is, Jesus says, it will seem as if things are being taken away from you. And, and that is always very frightening to the ego, because the ego has built its world and thinks its stability is based on financial security, on all types of physical security, relationship security, you know, it's it's bought a policy in time and space, the ego has, and it's filled it with concepts that it says are safe and secure. And then when you start to go towards the truth and call on the truth to set you free from it, it will seem as if a lot of these things start to fade away and disappear. How does the ego interpret this fading away and disappearing? As loss. It sees it as tremendous loss. You are failing. You are failing as a human being. You are failing on your spiritual journey. But Jesus says, you're so confused you can't judge your advances from your retreats. And he's just saying, stay with me. The goal is to just learn not to judge anything. To give every perception over to the Holy Spirit and say, you see this for me. To say, I, I don't know. I do not understand what anything is for. I cannot judge this. I cannot give meaning to this. I cannot, I cannot interpret what my eyes are perceiving. I cannot interpret meaningfully what I'm hearing. When, when sometimes when one spouse says to another, you know, I'm leaving you. Well, it's just words. I am leaving you. Jesus said, no problem. But the interpretation through the <laughs> ego's lens is loss, abandonment, betrayal. You can see, it's just four words, I am leaving you. Jesus is like, yeah, words are symbols of symbols, twice removed. Those are just four unreal symbols. They don't mean anything at all, but I am leaving you. Then, oh, I'm abandoned, I'm betrayed. You, you wicked one. You said this would last forever, you know. Now I'm lost without you. I was I was never good enough for you. <laughs> and it starts blasting away. Whatever those whatever said those four words are gonna get blasted with all torpedoes. <laughs> you know, how dare you say those four words? But but we know from the Bible that that's part of God's promises. I will never leave you comfortless. I will never forsake you. The, the Holy Spirit is saying the opposite words, is, I will never leave you, I'm with you all the way, to truth. I'm going to be here with you all the way, through everything. 
I am with you. That's what Jesus said before the puppet was gone. He said, I am with you even to the end of time. What a beautiful promise. I am with you even to the end of time. So even while you believe in time, it's like, well, there's one that said, I'm with you even unto the end of time. And that's the Holy Spirit speaking through the puppet of Jesus. The body of Jesus is not with us until the end of time. It's just another body among bodies. And, and the puppets come and go, like raindrops that dry up in the sunlight. They're there, and they're gone. They're there, and they're gone. People often say, what happens when, some, when a person dies? And it's like, people, people don't really die because they were never really born. You know, it's, you, if it's images, it'll be like going to a movie and then um, at the, I think there was a movie with Deborah Winger and Shirley McLean, and, and the Deborah Winger character seemed to come get a, a terminal disease and then die. If you went to that movie and you saw the movie, you may have tears with the, one of the main characters dies in the end, passes away. It's the same with that movie Love Story with uh, Ali McGraw and Ryan O'Neill, uh, where she has a terminal illness and dies at the end. But if you went to see Love Story, for example, which was quite a few decades ago, but if you went to see that movie and you came home and you told your spouse or your family you were crying, you were sad, and you said, yeah, she, she died. She died at the end. I'm sad. They'd say, but that's a movie. You know, the character died at the end of the movie. It was an actress. Like, like Javi would say, was, was Ali McGraw was playing a character, and that character seemed to have terminal illness and died, but she didn't really die. She didn't really die, she just was pretend, it was an act. She got paid. <laughs> <laughs> she got paid very well <laughs> for dying. Why are you sad? <laughs> she died. <laughs> Did she really? Yeah. The spouse says, she didn't really die, no, it's just an act. And that's the thing when we perceive this world, if we think that people really die and really disappear from our awareness and we're sad and we miss them, we have to go much deeper. We, we must believe something that's telling us something false. Because if love is reality, <coughs> oneness is reality, then we're sad. And we start grieving something that Jesus is saying never really in truth happened. It must be that we're just interpreting something and we're reacting with grief and sadness to the interpretation of what we're perceiving. Which can teach us a whole lot because Jesus is saying, yeah, that's the same with everything else too. Everything you think is happening positively in this world, according to your perceptions for your character, your puppet, that's a good thing for my puppet. More money. <laughs> Bigger house, more of this, more of that. Career advancement. What was it, the lesson for yesterday? Jesus used the word mad careers. So do we let go of mad careers? Mad careers. Our journeys. Artificial journeys. Artificial journeys. So this trip of David to Europe is an artificial journey. Now <laughs> Jesus said in the lesson yesterday, time to let go of artificial journeys. And mad careers. He's, he's like saying, Man, careers, what is he talking about? Is he talking about being an accountant or uh, a military general? Uh, is that a mad career? He says senseless journeys, artificial Sense values. Senseless journeys, artificial values, and mad careers. So if he's telling me to let go of mad careers, then the question would be, what is a mad career? And Jesus is saying, any career is mad, because any career is linear. And any career denies the present moment, denies who you are right now. Mm -hmm. and, and some people would say, well, what is he advocating then? And he does say, you have one vocation. In the Course, he uses the word vocation. That's as close as we get to career, that's mad careers. What is your vocation? He says, your vocation is healing. You have but one. You have only one vocation, and that vocation is healing. So you can see, coming from Jesus, it's very important. 
And what would that healing have to be except healing in mind? It wouldn't have anything to do with the body, because the body can be healed and seem to get sick again. Jesus was a puppet, and he, around him the dead were raised, the blind could see, the lame could walk. Uh, basically, he was casting out demons and all this and this, and then at the end, the people around him said, save yourself. Like, why can't you save yourself with all that big show you just did? <laughs> save yourself, but his self wasn't the puppet. The puppet didn't save anything. The puppet didn't really do anything either. The puppet was just a symbol of pointing to whole mind, holistic mind, unified mind. So the, the puppet was just a symbol, and all things in form are, are merely symbols. Just like when we dream at night, you know, there are dream therapists who will try to work with your dream symbols. You know, they say you like the, the color green, if you dreamed in green, well that means envy, or <laughs> jealousy, you know. There's, there's therapists that will actually start to take dream symbols and interpret the dreams. And those can be helpful to an extent, but then you have to ask yourself, what is the purpose? What is the purpose for my dreaming? What is the purpose for sleeping? If the goal is to wake up and remember reality, then why would I put so much emphasis on better sleep and worse sleep, or better dream symbols and worse dream symbols? When they're all equally false. So, this is, is what we're doing when we go deeper into, you know, how to not see error, do not see error. Because as long as we're still perceiving the error, then we will perceive the emotions that come with misperception. And those emotions are fear, guilt, you know, and all of the dark emotions, all the dark judgments, those are all based on mis misperceptions. It's not that there's an external world and we're, as a human being, perceiving an external world outside of the puppet. It's that the puppet is part of the perception. So that we must come back with everything to the mind. We must discover the power of our mind. The ego made this cosmos and world to make us mindless, to help us forget our divine mind, our vast powerful mind. And it gave us a body and a brain, and it gave us all kinds of substitutes. I remember, I used to listen to Madonna, you know, Material Girl, and all the different things, and then she came out with that album, Ray of Light, and I was like, Oh my God, Madonna's turning into a prophetess. <laughs> Ray of Light. One of the one of the songs was called "Substitute for Love." That's from the Course. <laughs> Should I wait for you, a substitute of love, a substitute, of, a substitute for love? That she was talking about a romantic partner as a substitute for love. I said, Oh my God, she's a prophetess. <laughs> The power of goodbye. Yeah, the power of goodbye, yeah. There's nothing left to lose, there's no heart left to bruise. There's no greater power than the power of goodbye. Uh, the, the, song, the songs, the lyrics, I was like, oh my God, Madonna's turned into a prophet. She's coming through as a modern day prophet. Well, she was raised Catholic and in Michigan and then came in now with Sex Appeal and Material Girl and now that uh, there's a, a song too about um, that we that basically all we need is love, which is what the Beatles has said. You know, she's basically telling us that, that our only need is love, and that's really what Jesus is saying in the course. That the only need we have is love, but the ego has taken that belief in need and lack and projected it so that it seems like the body needs things. It seems like the, the body needs lots of things, and really the only need is, is the need for love, or we could say forgiveness, of, of for, forgiving the illusion so we can uncover the love. Yeah, that's just, it's so deep, it's so deep. So that's 
what we're going to be doing this weekend is we start to take a look at our perceptions of the world, our need to achieve something in time and space, our need to accomplish something, and instead of going with that, that desire to become bigger, better, more of something, it's more of, of a letting go, of starting to realize, oh, things are naturally starting to dismantle and naturally starting to fall away, and to let that move through us with blessing, with a, with a feeling of gratitude and blessing, instead of a feeling of loss, hurt, uh, instead of feeling like we're hit to fight it. Mm. You know, an REO Speedwagon song. I can't fight this feeling anymore. I've forgotten what I started fighting for. <laughs> It's time to bring this ship into the shore and throw away the oars forever. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> REO, Speedwagon. Our prophets, prophets are all around us in the the rock bands. You know, Kansas. Carry on my wayward son. There'll be peace when you are done. Lay your weary head to rest. Don't you cry no more. Kansas! Kansas is going bye-bye now because we're starting to feel the, the depth, the profound awareness of these teachings that we're the Christ. And we've just fooled ourselves into believing in the specifics. And then beyond that, beyond making them up, inventing them through belief, and then starting to interpret them as if they have meaning. And Jesus is teaching us, no, nothing I see means anything. I've given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me, egoically. And, and my thoughts don't mean anything, and everything that I perceive in a linear way is really meaningless. So when I'm going on this journey, it's not going to be to make a better person to make a more fulfilled person, to make a more enlightened person, it is going to be a let go. We're in Spain, this is the, this is the place of many saints. Uh, you know, we were talking about Lucia, there's Saint Teresa, Saint John of the Cross, and uh, there's many saints, but saints are ones who have basically took a good look at the world and say, not my direction. And, and then when they started to go inward, they had to seemingly face darkness, night terrors, nightmares, sickness, different types of seeming symptoms with the body. They started to face all these things that, that were part of their belief system and just say, lead me God, show me the way. And they actually wrote, you know, they, they left the writings behind, but uh, it's not like those are big hits. These are not, the writings of St. Teresa are not going to make the bestsellers list. Uh, you know, there, there are those, there are the, the Deepak Chopras that are, are, are starting off and go around and, and are more the intro, entry level into these deeper teachings. They, they are there to meet the need because atonement works at all times and at all levels. So that's part of the mind turning inside and starting to go, there's more than what I have perceived. There is much, much more to see. There's a spiritual vision that would be the fullness of true seeing that I'm aiming for, and then everything else, all my other perceptions will have to cave in, will have to fall away like sand that's caught in the water, you know, just to be rinsed away and washed away. So, wow! This is <laughs> <exciting>. <laughs> Whatever you consider as, a, as an issue or a topic in your life, whatever you're still struggling with, then that, this gives us an opportunity to, to bring the illusion of what's underneath it to the light of truth, and then see it dissolve and disappear. So, do we have a microphone?
Or we don't even need a microphone. No. <laughs> we actually don't have a microphone. We don't have one either. <laughs> we don't need one, we don't have one. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm here too, the young of you at together with you really to explore, to look at things more deeply about what what it is that I'm holding on to that I need to see in a different light. Apparently before I got here you started to watch a movie, It Ends With Us. Mm -hmm. And the tagline for that movie is, if we don't end the pattern, the pattern will end us. Mm -hmm. You got through most of the movie within yeah, the last 20 minutes, 25-30 minutes of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. That's usually where all the breakthroughs come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very intense. I mean, the woman seemed to have like memories, like her, her father was abusing her, or her mother, and she has those flashing memories. And then she meets a man, and she, she falls in love. She's in love first with another man who was homeless, and then she falls in love with this other man, and they start a relationship. And, and she has those kind of weird experiences of, the, oh, he's violent. She believes he's violent, but it's very, like, suppressed. Because they seem to be so in love, but then there like, comes in certain times that he seems to be violent. Like, she sees her father when, when her husband interacts with her or her partner. So she sees those scenes of him, of, his, of her father um, raping uh, her mother. So she has this kind of intense experiences and thinking, oh, I'm not safe with this one, you know, it's, yeah, but yeah, we haven't seen the end, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's a good example of this, like the past, that is, you know, we believe it's the past, or we use the past to interpret the present, and it is so deep and unconscious that it's so quick, sometimes we just, we can be shocked about what's happening. We didn't know it was there in the mind. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because the ego is like that spider that's, that's hiding in the darkness of the well. And then on the surface of consciousness, in human awareness, it, it seems like there are attractions and repulsions, like likes and dislikes. But it's not seen that, that the attractions and repulsions and the likes and dislikes are part of the ego's system of protecting itself. If love is one, if God is one, if, if our identity is Christ, is pure oneness, then the only thing that makes sense in terms of attraction would be to use it as a symbol of like attraction of divine love, you know, for itself or the, uh, everything is love or a call for love, you know, seeing the, the call for divinity, the call for divine love. But, but on the surface of consciousness, it's those attractions and repulsions that seem to be different. And in this movie, they seem to be very different. And then, um, the deeper that one goes, it's more that the, the trick of the ego is unveiled that the attractions and the repulsions are just judgments of the images. Yeah. Uh, it's like positive judgments, negative judgments, in the end, yeah. any judgments of the images are going to make the error real. Yeah. Yeah. And so the error is perceived, it's perceived or seen as being external. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this movie actually <laughs> resonates quite a bit with me, because I had experience as a child and stuff, and, and I've had this um, thought I need to see the error so that I can let it go. So I wanted to see my biological father's errors. I made a prayer, let me just, you know, because it seemed so unconscious and blurry, and but that was like a, re a repulsion, of course, you know, that 
experience and, and I made a prayer this one day and I, God help me, you know, because it, it seemed to like hook me, it seemed to hold me down, these past memories. And so I sincerely asked God to see him. And I thought I would see, you know, see his faults. I thought I would see how I was mistreated or something. But all God showed me was light. I just had this experience. I said, show me my, my dad. Show me my father. And it was this light I was shown. And I realized that's what God will always show me. You know, this other stuff is, is the earthly realm. It's the, it is the projected universe, which this character was part of. Yeah, so it's very yeah. it's beautiful because it's it kind of starts to contrast true healing, which is true remembering of the light, versus human development or personal development. Within that context, it it always seems that there's past memories or childhood memories, or maybe even memories from other lifetimes, like past life regression. Uh, like I, I show that uh, Turkish series, Another Self, and the, their version of constellations, guided constellations to uncover these dark memories that have been pushed out of awareness. But I just showed that movie in Malaga, Time's End, just showing that it's not, it's not that the, these dark past memories are causative, because that would be back to karma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Things that you've done in the past, just you are at the mercy of repeating those over and over and over. But what Jesus is saying is, no, you had a choice to either remember the present or to cling to the past. And when you're clinging to the past, you're basically clinging, clinging to the ego's perspective, a past perspective, which is an interpretation of the bodies. And it's always wrong, whether it's a positive interpretation of the bodies or, or the negative. The positive interpretations are, are like the ones where there's more light shining through the, the, the dream symbols, so you feel much better, like closer to the light, but still the ultimate release point has to be a decision to just see the past as the past and yeah. to let it go. Yeah, because yeah, it doesn't seem to matter, because I used to be just like jealous or envy people who had a happy childhood or warm, loving experiences, and they seem to have it better, or they seem to have come further, or feel safer in the world. But it has nothing to do with anything. It's it's a dream, no matter what it looked like. But like this morning, I was drawn to the holy instant and special relationships, and it's talking about exactly what you've been talking about, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Instant is the Holy Spirit's most useful learning device for teaching you love's meaning. For its purpose is to suspend judgment entirely. Judgment always rests on the past, for past experiences is the basis on which you judge. And we wouldn't judge if we didn't draw from the past. Yeah. Judgment becomes impossible without the past, for without it you do not understand anything. And so I feel that David is oblivious a lot of times. Don't understand anything. We don't have time. We, we shouldn't understand anything. We shouldn't think we understand anything. We don't have to try to understand anything. Yeah, it's it's good to be clueless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, you would not you make you would make no attempt to judge because it would be quite apparent that that you do not understand what anything means. You're afraid of this because you believe that without the ego all would be chaos. Yet I assure you that without the ego all would be love. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's like the core of it right there. Yes. That it can't be a sacrifice to give up judgment. Mm unless I have the belief that the judgment is helpful in some way. Yeah. Giving up something that's helpful would be a sacrifice. Mm. Yeah. So, 
it's some sense, if you multiply that or you carry it out, you can start to realize that when the mind builds a self-concept that seems to be, have all these different components to it, and if something happens to, a, to my child, or something happens to my partner, or to my house, to my job, the things that have been given meaning in the dream world have, have been invested with value, and Jesus is saying, well, that's, that's your main problem. You're, you're investing the valueless with value. That's lesson number two from the workbook. I've given everything I see all the meaning. And then when something that you've given false value seems to disappear from your perception, like you lose your job, or a, or a child is killed, or, or a partner leaves, or all those kind of things, you interpret that you're living a life of deprivation, and things are always being taken away from you, instead of starting to see that, no, they just disappear from your perception when you no longer value them, when you, when you value the light more than these things of form, then the light comes in stronger and stronger into awareness. So that undoes this whole belief in sacrifice. And with many different religions, but including Christianity, that's the ego's attempt to hijack the teachings of Jesus by injecting sacrifice, penance, punishment, those things that are egoic interpretations into the beautiful teachings of, of Christ. And that's where there's such a resistance to organized religion, or to institutions that, that's, that claim to be doing everything that they're doing in the name of God, but there's it's this interpretation of sacrifice that doesn't sit well. Why would I have to sacrifice anything if God created me perfect? And I'm still perfect as God created me, why would I need to give up something real to know something that is eternal? When the eternal is the real. So th that's like this unconscious belief in sacrifice that relationships, the ego says, rela relationships, you know, you have to give and you have to get uh, with everything in jobs and careers. You give your time, and you get money. Uh, it's all about the giving to get, which is the ego's way to mix giving and getting, when Jesus says they don't mix. God only gives. God doesn't require your uh, personal attention or your personal devotion. God is a God of pure giving, and the Christ is a presence of pure giving. And that's what true generosity is. It's, it's the attitude of love. It's the attitude, the Beatitudes. It has nothing to do with the form. So that's quite, that's like the loosening up from the whole psychotherapy kind of model, human development model. Yeah. That's what your journey has been, is, yeah. is trying this, trying that, and then slowly going, wait a minute, this, this seems to be these experiences of light that or what is healing, not, yeah. not any understanding the darkness. Yeah. But yeah, it seemed uh, suppressed, because there was times of terror in, in, the, in this lifetime, and they were so scary, actually, that they were suppressed, so there was a need for it. was actually, it seemed to be a need for that processing, and allowing, and seeing. Yeah. Yeah. A joyful discovery, like I had a gentleman who's, he's, I think he's in maybe the first year of med school in England, and he's come across these teachings, and he just sends me many, many, many gleeful, uh, joyful uh, voicemails. Because he's in the first year of med school, and one of the areas that he's been looking at is the idea of nutrition. And he sends these squealingly, gleeful, delightful voicemails when he's starting to realize that that it's the thoughts that he needs to be looking at and not the foods. 
So these, you know, you have cookies and ice cream, and he's, he's totally gone. <laughs> gone. She was a dietitian, now she eats ice cream. <laughs> and you can imagine him in the first year of med school, just like with making these discoveries and and just squealing with delight that it's 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 the thoughts. And he's, and he's still in med school, so he's, he's probably going to have to be very playful. <laughs> if he's going to stay in med school, you've got to be quite playful with it. But, but it's like a discovery, almost like a, a childhood discovery when you discover something that's real and true. And, yeah. 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 Some of you remember the movie, What, what the Bleep Do We Know? And, mm -hmm. and then the second one, Down the Rabbit Hole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is Fred Allen Wolf, you know, so I remember him in there and with his hair flying all over the place and his joyful face talking about these discoveries in quantum physics. You know, he's quite uh, joyful. Somebody did bring to me a movie though where a lot of the, the leading, like Fred Allen Wolf and the, the leading uh, cutting edge thinkers in all the different fields all take a, a pilgrimage down to see the Dalai Lama. And it's just, you get this group of quantum physicists and people that are in the farthest reaches of, in the world's terms, of, of spiritual awakening, but they're more the, in, the, in the preschool. When they all get together, they're just arguing and irritated with one another, can't stand to be with one another. These are all of our heroes from the movies, you know. <laughs> and, then, and then they have to go before the Dalai Lama and try to listen to what he has to say. But it's a beautiful movie of healing, because it's just showing, oh, we have to let go of all of our preconceptions of everything and lay them on the altar mm -hmm. to the light. So, yeah, it's quite joyful. Yeah. I'm thinking of uh, this idea you mentioned about wrong actions, so in, in terms of the puppet, yeah, and uh, how to relate to this idea, this symbol of wrong actions in the dream, and the relevance for healing spirit, well, this, this term, wrong actions, you mentioned, and I thought, oh, okay, when, yeah, it's, my, it's, it's a question, maybe even in, uh, related to our, uh, the title of the retreat. Yeah. yeah. Do not see errors, like, how, how, if you start to look at, that was like, are you, so you've come here from, uh, Germany. From Germany. You need to tell me the story from last night. Which, oh, it was about last night. La last night or last, last, uh, last day? Yesterday, yeah. the story about Yesterday. Yeah, com coming over. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was uh, yeah, coming over to pick somebody up. And uh, the guidance of the community was it wasn't necessary. But I was already here. And I, I took a detour. Yeah, so I, and um, my first reaction was, okay, uh, was it was wrong, it was a wrong action. And I, I made a mistake. And I felt upset and guilty. And um, yeah, that this this idea to see it differently or to even to this idea um, what about next time? What should I do? What to to prevent me, or to prevent the spirit, or to prevent the world from um, uh, this this wrong action, seemingly. So then it becomes to me very real. Yeah, I, I, I make it real. This really happened, and uh, there is really a feeling of loss or of um, irritation. Uh, underneath this experience. Yeah, that's, that's a good starting point because that's, is that's like, okay, I took a wrong turn, I did a wrong action, and I want to not repeat that wrong action. Yes. And that's in terms of your personality self coming here and everything, but, but if we 
we went to things much more extreme, like uh, like Russia and, and Putin invading Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And you're a citizen, a civilian of Ukraine, maybe on the, or the eastern front or so forth, and then there's there's artillery, there's bombs, there's missiles, there's tanks, there's people with guns coming in, we'll say to Germany. Yeah. You know, saying, well, these people in Ukraine, they're Nazis, and oh, there's some that's still left over there, <laughs> you know, and just invading a country. Or even with Gaza, which is, we're right here, I'm looking out the window of the Mediterranean, you know, we're right on the edge of the Gaza Strip, is on the Mediterranean, like, like this land is. You just roll it down to the east a bit, and then you have, you, you know, lots of bombs dropping, and babies, women, children, civilians, you know, and, and we're going back to the so-called the terrorist attack of, during music festivals. People are there dancing in, in, in a music festival, and then all of a sudden, huge an invasion. If you take wrong action more to the extreme, uh, that the, this is a world that's a projection of the ego, and so it's a world of, of, of attack and defense. And it seems like defenselessness in the face of attack is, is to be ignorant or to, to be very uh, mentally disturbed. It seems more natural to defend an attack in this world. Mm -hmm. Somebody's invading your country, you know. And people have said for, for centuries, you know, like, well, Jesus, you know, you know, if somebody smites you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. If somebody, yes, for your coat, offer your cloak as well, you know, pray for your enemies, you know, bless those that curse you. It, it absolutely seems like an unintelligible teaching that Jesus was giving on planet Earth. Almost like, what are you saying? And a lot of the people, that's what they wanted to kill him too, was like overthrowing traditions, Jewish traditions, long-standing Jewish traditions, to say, you know, the, the prophecies are fulfilled, you know, and, and these are the ancient Jewish prophecies going back centuries, and then saying the prophecies are fulfilled. This is the fulfillment of all the prophets and the prophecies, you know, that even in, his own, in the synagogue they were ready to kill him immediately, because, because it doesn't seem to relate to this world at all. So, that's where we, we have to look at the full extent of the belief in self-hatred. We have to look at the full extent of the belief in attack and start to realize that what we had believed about attack was that, that in many cases we would say attack is not justified or defense is not justified, but, but there's always exceptions. We would say like attack, self-defense, to defend yourself from an attack in self-defense. But Jesus is saying you've got to go even deeper. You have to say what is the self that is in the need of defense. Mm -hmm. You see, he's going right for that construct of the personality self, the body self. He's going to say that identification with the body self. Chiquita and I had that talk, I think we were talking one time on there, and you were even looking at those ideas, like what if Germany was invaded? What if my country was invaded? Yeah, I think it was about my uh, family in Lithuania. Lithuania, yeah, Lithuania. Which is very close. Very close, yeah. 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 And starting to open your mind more and more to this, the grace of defenselessness. The grace of all things work together for good, you know, the, to go much, much deeper than, than the typical actions and reactions, the typical world views or, or views mm -hmm. of that. You know, towards towards the light of what Jesus is really teaching. Because it's lesson 135, if I defend myself, I'm attacked. Where Jesus says, what but the body? What, what would it be possibly that could ever need any defense? What but the body is in need of defense? 
And he says, you know, you have no need of any defenses, because he starts to go at it like, if the body is the thing that you're identified with, that is where all your defenses come from, and he's saying that's, that's the case, then he's saying, you must believe that this pile of dust and water has value and importance. He's going in that lesson to, to really start to show the nothingness of the body. He's saying it's not your home, you think it, it has served you, you think it has sheltered you from something, but you, you don't really recognize the value that you've placed on it. Because all of your defense mechanisms, whether they're medical defense mechanisms, psychological defense mechanisms, or it's it's an armament, and countries, you know, spending, you know, huge budgets on, on weapons and defense and everything. He says it's basically all coming down to body identification. And so he's encouraging us to get in touch with our mind, get in touch with our divinity, get in touch with our strength, which is really the mind, the power of the mind. And he's saying the more you do that as practice, you'll see more and more the, the nothingness of the body. And as you start to see the nothingness of it, then even the idea of Dirk was saying about making a wrong turn. A body that made a wrong turn. Hmm. It's almost, you know, you start to really start to get more of a feel like, hmm, why am I trying to, to correct it? Because <laughs> it's a, Jesus is teaching us that the body is a learning device for the mind. But the body doesn't really feel, it we, seems like it feels lots of things, but Jesus says, no, the mind just projects its feelings onto the body. He even says in a workbook lesson, I think it's maybe 136, the next lesson, you could tell you practice well by this, the body should not feel at all. What? <laughs> and, and why would he say such a thing? The body should not feel at all. It, maybe it, unless the body never feels at all, and it's just a deception of projecting emotions onto the body. So, the main thing that Jesus is saying is, you've made, with the ego's belief system and the power of your mind, you've made this projection called a cosmos. And out of the whole projection you've identified with this little slab of flesh, this because a pile of, of dust and water. You've, you've identified your very being with this pile of dust and water. He says, parts of the Course, surely what it's made of is not valuable. You know, he, he'll try to be very logical, like, really, look at this. It's not going to last forever, and surely what it's made of, you know, out of everything, why would you value flesh? Why would you value a heartbeat? Why would, would you value it? Unless you thought your identification with it protected you from something that you're more afraid of. So, it's the ego that's terrified of the light. It's the little spider that's afraid of the light. But when you identify with the ego, then those fears seem to be projected to, sometimes to the body, or sometimes they seem to be psychological fears. Of, of fears of getting lost. Uh, but basically what he's teaching us, and this is the deep teaching, is that the body is a learning device. And the body makes no mistakes. <coughs> all mistakes are of the mind. So that's the first lesson. All illness is mental illness, and all mistakes are of the mind. And I must first come to realize that my body has never made a mistake. I never did anything wrong with this body. And I never did anything right with this body either. You have to see, you have to take both sides of it. I can't Say, oh great, I did not I never did anything wrong. I'm an innocent body. And Jesus is like, no, you never did anything right either. Because it's a learning device. It would if if we took another example and bring it home a little bit, let's use this iPhone. Because this iPhone in the ego's perception is a supercomputer. It has a processor. If you get the later ones, it has very, these are very powerful computers. I mean, when I think of the early days of Steve Jobs and the first Apple computers and Macintosh, you know, these things blow those away. You know, this would be 
more of the IBM used to have huge rooms full of giant computers with little card readers and everything back in the day when I first started the university they had card readers. That's how you got data into computers through the card readers and then this would the if we saw a glimpse of this we'd say, What's that little thing in your hand? It's a super computer. <laughs> what do you use it for? Just about everything, except sex. Anything <laughs> 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 else? Yeah. This thing can do. People won't leave home without it. <laughs> you know? Because it, it seems to be so valuable. Let's just use this now as an analogous to the body. Jesus is saying, no, this is just an unreal image. It's a projection of the ego, like all the rest, like the, the plants and the stars and the animals and the people and everything else. The cosmos. This is just an image. But, lesson number two, I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. Look at the word utility or usefulness. We'll say usefulness that's projected onto this little thing. And Jesus is saying, you're doing the same thing with your body. You think it's real, you think you live in it, you think you have to protect it, you think it makes mistakes, and it has wrong actions and right actions. You're trying to get more of the right actions to come from it. So Dirk's saying, yeah. what can I learn to, next time if I come over from Germany to not <laughs> take the wrong turn? You see, you're, it's so much is about correct behavior, but Jesus is saying what you do comes from what you think, and it's with your thoughts alone that we must work. He's not interested in the projections, because these are all effects. The phone is an effect, the body is an effect. It's an unreal effect from an unreal cause. What's the unreal cause? The ego. What's the unreal effect? The image, the projection of, of, of the ego. God didn't create the body or the iPhone. And Yet, we can start to see, now you see this one has a little cover. See, this one is dressed up. You look yeah. very closely. This is not a naked. <laughs> <laughs> this is, it's got a bikini on. <laughs> Rear coverage, frontal exposure. <laughs> it's not like a typical bikini. <laughs> it, it, it is wearing a bikini and it's, it's it's got a hard kind of plastic protected. It's snug. It fits a very snug machine because it fits on there. So when it cracks, and if you look very closely at this, you can see, if, if, well, when it goes back off, there's a little crack. It has a blemish on it. It's got a little crack on it. And yet Jesus is saying, it's an unreal effect of an unreal cause. It actually does nothing. And it actually has no value. Every value you believe it has is a value that you've given to it from the past. Just like he says in the workbook of the Course in Miracles, you could receive vision, he's talking about the vision of Christ from a table, if you withdrew everything you believed about the table from the table. Size, shape, texture, color, you know, everything that you believe about a, a table, if you withdrew all your ideas from a table, you could receive the vision of Christ. You could do it with the body too, if you removed everything that you've ever believed from that body. And could, could see it. That was a lesson a few days ago, several days ago. My, my body is a holy neutral thing. Yeah, that was one of our workbook lessons recently. That's what he's doing in that lesson. He's just saying, remove all that you've thought about this body and let the Holy Spirit show you the light that, of who you are. Don't tell the table what it is. Let the table tell you who you are. That's what the table wants to do. It would rather tell you who you are than hold cups and candles and <laughs> our flowers. It would rather do its real function <laughs> and say, <laughs> it rather, if, if the table had a choice, it would rather join the whole universe in telling you the truth of who you are, than to be misused by the ego as an object of misuse. So, if we come back to the iPhone, this, it just, it seems to have so many meanings, but this would be the best use of an iPhone, is to 
Ask the iPhone to tell you who you are. If you do your Course in Miracles search with it, it will. <laughs> <laughs> I have this guy famous. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But, but as long as I have some kind of identity attachment with it, meaning I believe I need it for the body's survival, for example, or for the body's convenience, or for the body's comfort, or for the body's ease, or for the body's anything, then suddenly this wholly neutral thing takes on immense value and importance, because it's been given that importance by the ego. And, and that ego valuing of something in form is what we call death. Death is not the cessation of, of breath or of uh, neurological activity in the body and the brain and everything. Death is the attempt to give false meaning where there is no meaning. All meaning is of God. Meaning Christ is a creation of God, so Christ has meaning. I had students back in the 1990s and I remember we were at a, at a house in Michigan, I think, and people were recording sessions with me, and a group of uh, some of the female students had cut, had discovered a line in the course, and they that was the topic of the session. When I came to do a session, I said, does anybody have anything bothering them, disturbing them? They said, yes, we found a line in the course that we, dis we don't understand at all. I said, okay, what's the line? What's the line in the course? And they said, no one can be angry at a fact. He said, that, you don't get that. What, what does it mean? Nobody can be angry at a fact. And so, well, that's, that's a very straightforward and obvious teaching. You can never be angry at a fact. So the next question was, what's a fact? <laughs> I said, well, God is a fact. And Christ is a fact. And creation is a, is a fact. No one can be angry at a fact. If you, if you knew the fact of the matter, <laughs> then you could not be angry. But anger only comes from miscreation and misperception. To believe you can create something that's not real is miscreation. That's, that's the misuse of, of a God-given ability, miscreation. And, and misperception would be to perceive something that is not there, and then get angry at something that's not there. That's lessons five, six, seven, eight. I'm never upset for the reason I think. I'm upset because I see something that is not there. That lesson six is basically saying that the perceptual world is a hallucination. You're you're imagining. You're, you're doing fiction. You're you're imagining something that doesn't exist, and it's upsetting. I'm never upset for the reason I think. Causation. I'm upset because I see something that's not there. I'm upset because I'm misperceiving. I'm, I'm upset because I'm in, engaging in fantasy instead of God's creation. I'm, I'm engaging in fantasy with, with this body and five senses, with this egoic perception. I'm upset because of that, not because of an event that I've said is upsetting me in form. But I'm upset because I'm attempting to do something that God didn't give me the ability to do. I, I see mm -hmm. only the past, lesson number seven. I'm, I'm perceiving something that's not there, it's called the past. And my mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. That's why I'm perceiving something that's not there. Okay, well let's, let's go to our philosophers and our psychologists to, to get some help with this because those lessons are like, wow, that's, like, imagine Freud having something like those four lessons, or Carl Jung having those four lessons to ponder, like, what is that saying? Well, let's look at, at the definitions of illness, of mental illness that are part of psychology and psychiatry. Let's start off with schizophrenia. You know, we've seen movies that have portrayed 
schizophrenia, and we've had, some of us have had experiences with people who've been diagnosed as schizophrenic, but schizophrenic is, is a split mind, that's one of the things, part of schizophrenia, is to have a split mind. Does the sleeping mind that believes in a world that God did not create, does it have a schizophrenic condition? Does it believe in both love and fear, of both the ego and the Holy Spirit? Yes. So I'm dealing with schizophrenia on a daily basis. I'm dealing with schizophrenia. I'm dealing with a split mind. I'm dealing with hearing multiple voices and seeing characters that are not there. Did anyone ever see the movie A Beautiful Mind? You know, great mathematician, and he's seeing imaginary characters, he's hearing voices that aren't there. He seems to be a genius who's got this schizophrenic condition, but Jesus is saying, no, if you have, if you believe in a split mind, if you're hearing voices that are not there, and you're seeing people that are not there, and seeing a world that is not there, an imaginary world, that's schizophrenic. So, so, that's what we're dealing with. We can't put this on the body. If our mind is dealing with a schizophrenic condition, why would we blame the body, or try to even make it better, or, or change it? <laughs> why would we try to even improve it, if it's, if it's being perceived through a schizophrenic condition? And then, psychosis. Well, psychosis is defined as a break from reality. Well, what if reality is spirit, is heaven, is love, is oneness, and this world is a psychotic episode. It's a break from reality. If heaven is reality, if God is reality, then this world is a break from reality. So, okay, now we've established schizophrenic, psychotic, and then it used to be called multiple personality disorder, but I think correctly now it's called dissociative identity disorder, DID. This is the current configuration of what it's called. Dissociative Identity Disorder, Multiple Personality Disorder. What if you're perceiving, if your mind is perceiving multiple personalities, if it's in a multiple personality misidentification, what if it's, if there's 7.8 billion people on this planet, and the sleeping mind has a bad case of DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. It's dissociated the Christ. It's dissociated, it's forgotten the Christ. It's pushed the Christ completely out of awareness. And now it's identified with altars, they call them, in DID. It, it's identified with many altars. And the personality self that you believe you are and believe everyone else is, is part of the DID. Now, that gives us new way of looking at things, because we can clearly see that in, in those, those are all three mental disorders. And the bodies, the alters or the bodies in any of those three diagnoses are, are not the problem. It's the mind's distortion of perception that is the problem. It's hallucinating, it's, it's split, it's seeing characters that aren't there, and it's feeling emotions that aren't really there, and it's, it's interacting and reacting as if things are real. I think out of the three, the, the most fascinating of all to me is DID, because with like Sybil and a lot of that, when, when the mind has a DID disorder, and it seems to have these different alters or different personalities that it shifts into, when it shifts into the personality, everything in the body shifts as well. One, one uh, personality may have cancer, and when it's in that personality, the body seems to have cancer. It, they, the doctors can find evidence of the cancer. And another personality, no cancer, it's just, it's gone. Instantaneous. That's a pretty strong uh, example of, of projection. When the DID, when the personality shift and the body corresponds to shift in, in all ways, including even physicality, it's showing it's all mental, it's all mental. So if we come back 
to the body and the iPhone metaphor, you know, you can think of the body in terms of the past or the future, but you can only really think of the iPhone in terms of the past and future too. It has no meaning in the holy instant, because God didn't create it. So then you start to look at things like utility, what, what is it for? You can see where all this is going. Now, we're in Spain, the land of the mystics and saints, guess where we're headed? Into mysticism. This is a community. Now the house, you're saying this is like the start of, of a community here. But if the community is dedicated to God, then, then really the prayer is for the light. The prayer is for the light. You're, you're asking for the light, and that means that everything will be used to remove the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence. So it's, when you make that, you're not like looking to, to do something, build something in the world, you're not like looking to build another temple. So, oh, we have another temple on the Mediterranean, mark the spot, you know. <laughs> it's more that you're saying, let this be used for the undoing of everything I believe about the past that I'm still holding on to, I'm still trying to keep current. And at the end, it's like the stories from India, you know, where <coughs> the, the yogi's just wearing like a little g-string and he's got like a little mat. And he, he gets up to go into the woods to defecate and to pee and comes back and his mat's gone and he's furious. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's, that's a good example, you know. All he has is the mat and the g-string. He's wearing the g-string, but he comes back the mat is gone. It's like somebody stole on his house. <laughs> but it's the interpretation <laughs> that my mat, <laughs> that's a killer. My, 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 it's a possession. It's the possession in the mind that's upsetting, it's not the things of the time and space. We're here to let the Holy Spirit use, use all the symbols of the world in a happy dance, where we can, can let them all be used, judgment through us rather than by us, it's judgment of the Holy Spirit for happiness. It's all to be used for, for happiness, it's all to be used without expectations, it's all to be used for the undoing of expectations and preconceptions and beliefs. Yeah. So, if you didn't make the mistake, the, 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 you can't you have to let the body of dirt off the hook. There's a drama, much to do about nothing. It seems yeah. that the other God is involved in the drama. Yeah. The other characters, like a little theater. Mm. As you appearing here, and Kobus had already arranged a ride with Daniel and Marie. Yeah. And you, were, you had not been told that. So, yeah. No. But you were told you shouldn't be here. And, yeah. So they were skit. That was a perfect play, right? Because it's, it's a situation, it's not really only, only boys, it's the whole situation. It's, it, uh, in that moment, it uh, seems to be real. And I think behind it, this idea that um, I'm looking for God. Mm. Yeah, where, where is the guilt? Who is guilty? And, and even now hearing you, I, I hear guilt. Mm. Yeah, I, I haven't spoken to you about it. And I, I, oh, it's my mistake. So it's, I feel inside me still looking for reason, for guilt, for cause, cause and effect. Where's the cause? And I need to know, right? And that's perfect in community. That's how it comes up. I had a, a lot saying, you know, like, oh, they're welcome, but I'm not welcome. I have guilt, I perceive through yeah. a guilty lens. And because later on, P 
Peter texted me saying, can I come over and help with anything? And I thought, just yes, you know. So if I think of my own past, I would probably say, oh, I wasn't welcome, but they're welcome, you know. Like, yeah. But it's the guilty lens. It's what you're saying. It's, yeah, it's, it's you know? guilty lens, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and, and comparison then, you know, I don't be all helpful, not helpful. This idea of what is helpful, not helpful. This idea about communication and what, how should I um, communicate better? All these ideas, right? So, and, uh, and I think if I if I remain on this level of the body and the, these behaviors, or my past comes in, ah, oh, again, I did it again, uh, or I should have done something different. Yeah, it's interesting, this whole play, it's, yeah. it's just a play in that to, to realize, to practice the lessons and see this, the, the forgiveness opportunity, right? It's about yeah. Yeah, to forgive. Yeah, if we go even back prior to the time of Jesus to Plato's cave analogy, mm. it's, all, it's all right there. It's all the Plato's cave analogy, you know, that there seem to be prisoners, they're, they're locked down inside a cave, they're <clears throat> all that they perceive are the other prisoners that are locked down. It's very dark, and they can perceive the cave wall with all of these images that are on it. That's all that they know. Before we had movie theaters, before we had the modern metaphors of movies, you know, we can say that the prisoners in, in Cato's play the cave analogy, they're watching the images on there and that's all that they know. They just they mm -hmm. locked in there and that's all that they know. They don't know the light that's outside, they don't know that there's puppeteers and marionettes. All they can see is the images on the rock. And you might say that's the predicament of the human condition is we're dealing with these images. Mm -hmm. And this image of dirt, you know, do the, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Say the right thing, have the right actions, and be a good Dirk. Be a good marionette. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be a good marionette. Yeah. You know, we all raise them. Better watch out. No, we're not pout. Better not cry. I'm telling you why. You know, we're this. This, this is guiltville. This is, you know, we all live in the same town. <laughs> and the town is Guiltville because, because we really are concerned about the actions and the perceptions of this puppet. From all the other puppets, we don't. <laughs> we're concerned about the perception of, of the puppet from within, so to speak, and also what the other puppets think. And, and you can see what an impossible situation it's, it's a situation that's set up for guilt. It's a set up for there never to be an end, you know, for the prisoners to stay locked in that cave, chained down, and watching those images on those rocks, until one prisoner gets up, you know, gets free of the chains, goes out, sees the light, sees the baryonets, which is like seeing the thoughts in the mind, but that, that are casting the shadows, mm. those are the egoic thoughts, and then sees the light beyond the, those marionettes, mm. the, the, yeah. the light of day, the light of daylight, the light of spirit. It's a beautiful, that, that analogy is so deep because it's, it's still <coughs> relevant. It was, this is from way before the time of Jesus and it's still absolutely relevant for us now because we're the reason we're feeling guilt is we're putting meaning on to those shadows. And before I came here to Europe, I mean, it seems like every time I come to Europe over the years, it's been something huge. One time I came and they discovered uh, the God particle uh, when I was over here. Of all the centuries, the, the physicists discovered the God particle when I'm in Europe. <laughs> they, they announced, they discovered the God particle, which was a particle that was throughout the fabric of time and space, and so the physicists called it the God particle. I, I, I can't come up with a better name than that, but 
because it's, it's within everything in the fabric of time and space. That's why they called it, because it seemed to be everywhere. So they called it the God Particle. Then one time I came over, uh, a Pope had resigned, and they were waiting to see the smoke come out and to proclaim that, like I said, it's always some big event when I come to Europe. Like, you know, it's the, and then Pope Francis emerged from, I was still in, moving around the countries, and they, we have a new Pope! <laughs> pope Francis! God Particle, Pope Francis, what is it next? I came over one time, I'm going through, I'm over in Germany, going to all the different countries. It's the Euro Cup. It's the Euro Cup. Big deal over here, the Euro Cup. The countries pooling it out with sucker football to see who is going to be the European champion. Like they have, I guess in South America, what's it called down there? Or something? Copa America. Hmm? Copa America. Hmm. Copa America. Copa America. Yeah, it was, this was the Euro Cup. So I'm going, doing gatherings around Europe, but people are huddled around television sets. Like this whole, whole emotions are up high. Like, this is an interesting way to see Europe. It's the Euro Cup. He said, David, have you heard of the World Cup? I said, yes. He said, this is the Euro Cup. <laughs> so everywhere I went, in Germany, there was Euro Cup, every Europe, 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 Europe. Then when finally I came to Spain, and I was at a suburban, I was on top of a roof giving my last gathering, my last talk uh, of my whole Europe tour, and I was outside of Madrid, I think, in a suburban area near some mountains. And when I spoke the last word of my last talk, Spain erupted. <laughs> and just at the very moment I spoke my last word, it was just like fireworks went off. And went. It was like, ooh, a very beautiful fitting end to my last talk. <laughs> celebrating. I was like shooting rockets and fire. So I, I looked out and there were people with painted faces and, and yellow and orange and running banners running around. Spain had won the Euro Cup <laughs> on the last word of the last talk. So this time, yeah, it's interesting to see <laughs> what's going to happen. But, but it's all just symbols, you know, we start to just see, I saw that as a celebration. Oh, this is beautiful, this is a celebration. But you, you have to take all the the meanings away from it, in terms of form, to start to really feel the celebration in your heart. Just the celebration of the moment, of the celebration of God, the celebration of eternal life. You know, that's what's so joyful. That really is, is the ultimate celebration, is our identity. Our identity as a creation of God. That's like a super celebration, beyond all the other celebrations. So, but we have to, we can't keep uh, keeping score with the, with the character, with the marionette. Oh, three wrong actions, two right actions. Three to two. It's not, good. It's, it's not a good score. It's a losing score. If we have more negative meanings than we have positive meanings, you see that it's an impossible equation. And we've set it up for the human being. Yeah. Yeah, anyone else have any ideas? Anything? I just want to share that uh, you were just saying that if if the table, you know, if I let go of my perceptions of the table, the table would would show me what I am. And I I went into this experience just just now. Of the table showing me what I am. Yeah, it's just, just a person in tears. <laughs> That's it. That's all we do. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Tell me who I am. Yeah. <laughs>
That's how we find the innocence. Tell me who I am. Mm -hmm. Show me who I am. If we don't ask that of it, then, then we have to try to maintain the table. Oh, it looks like it needs some shellac or paint. You know, if it, if it has a broken leg or, you know, we do this with iPhones, with cars, with bodies. If we don't ask them to tell us who we really are, then, then the opposite happens. We're, we're telling it what it is. And, and when we do that, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. it seems to, that's, the, that's where the problems start. Mm -hmm. It should be more. It shouldn't fail me. It should work, you know. Mm -hmm. That's, you were saying, it wasn't too long ago when the, the tree right outside the window here mm -hmm. just burst into sparks. Fireworks. Fireworks. Kind of, yeah. Because there was, what, two, three wires? Yeah, there was, I mean, there's one wire and there were three in one, so to speak. But it was raining a lot, and the branches touched the wire. And the whole morning was like sparkling with you know, this electric, electric in the water connecting, and then it was out for four days. Four day power outage here, yeah. yeah. Before, in the middle of planning for this, <laughs> preparing. <laughs> And then I came in to show a movie, and I was going to show a movie, and I was sitting over here, and it was the water next to me and everything. <laughs> and I was so excited, I went like this, and the water flew out of the cup and into the circuit in the wall, and everything went completely dark. And I'm like, Whoa. it's like, Phew. And all in the dark. It was one swoop. You know, it, it, it just, but it's like, well, what's the purpose underneath everything? That's what, what we always have to come back to, the, the moment. It's just taking us into the moment. And like with the, the power going on for four days, it's only the struggle only comes into, now this is the time we have designated to prepare for the gathering. Mm -hmm. And the power going out was, was showing that yeah. Expectation. And nobody knew about it because it, it was it's a little, seemed to be local error, of course, because it was here. We called the power company and they said, you know, it's a central problem and we're working on it. We're on it. It's going to be fixed in two hours. And they said that for four days. And we kept <laughs> calling. And that was a thought. It was like, oh, we're isolated. They don't know about this, you know. And that was another thing to overcome in the mind. Like, Oh, they don't know about this. They're working on another problem, saying that that is the problem. You know, but that was all. From. Spirit had me go into the cottage where David is staying to see everything that needed to be done there. And then was just then soon thereafter we had power again because it, that was a very helpful purpose to go there and see. Because yeah. yeah, actually we just purchased that property with the foundation and. Former owner said, because we had told him, shared a little bit what's happening, and he said, oh, so a very um, powerful being is going to stay in this house? He said, you know, so yeah, mm -hmm. you know, the spirit is it's orchestrating everything. Yeah. yeah, if you take that and that metaphor analogy or anything, there's, there's two lessons in the course, lesson 79 and 80. Let me recognize the problem so it can be solved. Mm -hmm. And then lesson 80 is let me recognize my problems have been solved. But he's saying you, you can't accept that all of your problems have been solved until you first recognize the problem as it is, not the way that you set it up with the ego. So really, again, the only problem is the belief in identity as ego, the belief in separation from God is the only problem. It's the central problem. It's the problem that all psychotherapy is aimed to realize, to first recognize this one problem. Because all misperception and all perception of linear time comes from this one tiny, tiny, tiny problem. Jesus calls it a tiny mad idea. It's a tiny mad idea. He puts tiny in front of it. Tiny, mad, insane. 
idea. But this is what we've been talking about today, and this is what the power outage example is, is an example of, is because if I don't recognize the problem, even if I already have the solution, the solution won't help me because I've misperceived the problem. We were using an example with Dirk about coming here and seeming to take a long, wrong turn, and Dirk saying, there was this one misaction that I would like to correct it. So if I come again, I don't make that same mistake. But, but it wasn't the misaction that was the problem. It was the, it was the belief in separation from God. It was the belief in an identity apart from God, which is behind the whole invention of the world. The belief that it's possible to leave the mind of God, to be Christ, an idea in the mind of God, and to leave the mind of God. That, that is the, the one problem. That's called the fall from grace, in the belief in separation. In many different traditions there's always a, a fall from grace, and that's, that's one problem. So that's what the practice is, is whenever there seems to be an upset to say, oh, this is, here it comes again. This is just exposing the one belief. And that's why I always say, it's the first step in spiritual awakening is just to come to an admission that there's a perceptual problem, an admission that the perception of this world is cracked. I'm seeing a world of separate people, places, things, I'm seeing a world of pieces. Almost like if, if the whole cosmos was like one giant, giant, giant cosmic mirror, just a shiny, 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 flat, smooth mirror, and then on some point of that mirror you put a, a pressure point, and you pushed in to that mirror with a pressure point, and it it started to crack into millions and billions and trillions of little pieces from this one pressure point. That's more like the Big Bang. It's, it's taking what is smooth and unified and one, like a giant mirror, and then putting a pressure point onto it, and it breaking in, into all these fissures, all these little tiny cracks, and just breaking into more and more and more teeny pieces. So, that from inside of that cracked perception, there is no <coughs> escape and there is no solution. That's why ultimately, when we try to go to seminars about fixing our relationships, fixing our finances, fixing our, our opinions and conclusions and assumptions about the world, those are all stepping stones to go deep, 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 deep inside to this belief in separation, in lack, in guilt, and then have it transformed to a unified perception of, of wholeness, of, of unified awareness. So, if we go back to Dirk's example, like, okay, there was a misaction, there was, a, there was some misturn, and I don't want to miss that turn again, I don't, when I come back, in a future hypothetical new situation, that I don't make the same mistake in form. What Jesus is saying is there never are any old situations or new situations. All situations are happening not on a timeline like in reincarnation, but all of them are happening simultaneously. That's why now there's all this talk of What's the movie? How do you this me to show the movie everything, everything everywhere, everywhere all at once? That movie is all about the multiverse. And Jesus is saying, well, the multiverse is actually a single verse. It's a song of separation and it's it's a happy song when you see that it's one song, and it's unhappy when you see it as multi. Because God is one and and the closest Thing to coming back to the light is to see everything in a unified way. So in that movie it's showing the multiverse as if there's all these different universes happening, and the value of that movie is it's, it's saying they're all happening at once. 
The people who made that movie, I, they had so much fun making the movie. I, I always like to watch the extras and they're just, the director was having a blast. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis was having a blast here. Every single one who was in that movie, when they came up for Academy Awards and everything, they were all laughing their way on the stages and everything. And uh, I think it was juxtaposed, I could feel that movie had so much of a joyful energy with it, because uh, they had another movie, it was a big, giant Marvel movie that involved, who's the guy that, that spins things and goes through holes. Uh, Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, yeah. There was a, a, a Doctor Strange a movie first. that came out at the same time as this, and I thought, wow, this one, this smaller budget movie seemed to be, they had so much fun making it, even though it was much smaller than the Marvel, you know, budget and everything. And, and what Jesus is using that movie for is he's saying, you have to start to think, think in terms of holistic terms. If you're thinking in terms of linearity, if you're thinking in terms of boxes and compartments and categories, that's the problem. Uh, first of all, God didn't create time, so this whole past, present, future construct of the ego I like it in the Course where Jesus says, the ego invented linear time and then it tries to force continuity onto time. I love, love it when Jesus uses that word, force, because there's control underneath that. It tries to force continuity. So we're trying to look for continuity in our relationships. That's why if you talk to people and they say, well, I was in a relationship for two weeks, but it falls short of my grandparents, who were married for 57 years. Mm -hmm. You see, see the judgment? <coughs> and, and a little bit shorter, you know, like they, it was an achievement. <laughs> they, they managed to stay married for 57 years. Actually, I did have two grandparents, Harry and Lillian, and they were married for 57 years. <laughs> so if the David character has a two-week relationship, <laughs> then there could be a judgment. Nice try. <laughs> Small fry. <laughs> when you've been married for 57 years, you know. You see, we put our relationships on this hierarchy of values. We have strangers, acquaintances, friends, best friends, partners, life partners. You know, it's like a continuum. And the life partners are at the top, and the ones that we meet for five seconds in the elevator. You know, with the time of day. Ding! The door opens. <laughs> okay, it's the end of that relationship. <laughs> and Jesus is trying to teach us that the ding, the six second ride, <laughs> and the 57 year old marriage are actually the same. Um, you see, the guilt that comes, that's projected on relationships, is like, it should have been longer. It shouldn't have been. The other thing is, we have these strange rituals where we have people that we're acquaintances, we meet, or that we're attracted to, and then we cross an invisible, imaginary line that we call in a relationship. When is it that a relationship starts? <laughs> What's the definition of when a relationship starts? You know, there are different definitions. Sometimes it's talked about with sexuality, Sometimes it's talked about when two people move into the same house magically. Oh, we were just friends, we were just dating, but we moved in together. Oh, ooh, meaning, when we moved in together, the expectations grew like a giant force. <laughs> you have to sit down in the toilet. You have to up. You know, it's like, suddenly, Sure, you're in public restrooms your whole life, you don't care. It sits up and down, and then you move in together. Oh. I see, it gets really heavy because Jesus is saying is, it's because you break the world into situations, like a relationship. When does it begin? When does it end? That's an artificial beginning, artificial ending. Was it five seconds, five minutes, five years, 57 years? 
the Aliyah would say, ah, 57 years. You tolerated each other for 57 years. <laughs> you get silver, no, you get gold. You get gold, gold anniversary is 50. You move past gold. You're on your way to platinum or something else, you know, which the ego says is good. But you see, the ego takes everything in terms of money, resources, relationships, and even with dirt, the situation, like if I come again, I don't want to fall into the same mistake. I don't want to make that wrong turn again. Mm -hmm. And the ego would say, very good, if you can come correctly next time, you know, very good, you're a, a better dirt. <laughs> you see? Yeah. But see, this is how the ego makes up a construct of a body and a person, and that we never seem to be good enough mm. in the construct. Why? Because we're really the Christ, dreaming we're the construct. And the construct is generated out of guilt, so we're always going to feel less than, less than perfect. And if the Christ is a perfect creation of a perfect God, then of course, by definition, it's set up. So that's why this is guilt though, you know, it's, there's one part of the Course where Jesus says, you are guilty in time, but innocent in eternity. That's so important, because there's some part of us that wants to be innocent in time. And he's already said, no, no, you're guilty in time, and, and sinless and innocent in eternity. You're still as God created you, as an eternal being. You haven't left your source. So that shows you how deep the guilt runs. It's not so much about our actions, but it's about our thoughts. Our thoughts of time and space and personalities and boxes and categories and all those things. It's the categorizing, analyzing, breaking apart mechanism in our mind, which is the ego. And that's the problem. It's not what seems to be judged as an outcome in the world. Like, there's an outcome for Dirk, it's like, oh, it goes good, the trip is going really good from Germany, and then I got over to Spain and, oh, a mistake occurred, you know, in a certain location. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 the, the mistake didn't occur anywhere along the trip, and the mistakes don't happen in time, because again, the body is just a learning device, and he tells us in the Course, the body makes no mistakes. The body is part of a perception, and you can either have a cracked and fragmented and disorienting perception, which is wrong-mindedness, or you can have a unified awareness, which is right-mindedness. So the mistake is only a decision in the mind, and it has to do with your purpose. It has nothing to do with what the body does. You can start to feel like, oh my God, better already just hearing this from Jesus, because it's like lifting, oh, I don't have to go back to all those therapy sessions, and, <laughs> and, on and on. 15 years of therapy sessions, only to then get into past life regressions, and realize it wasn't this lifetime, it was back when I was Cleopatra. <laughs> that my relationship with Julius Caesar, when I was Cleopatra, no, it wasn't that either. It wasn't that, you know, you start to realize it's not something that is in time, that is the mistake. It's the, it's the fragmented perception of time that Jesus realized was unreal. That was the great lesson that Jesus brought. It wasn't, it wasn't resurrection of a body, you know. When people just see it in terms of form, they think, okay, Jesus, Sometimes Jesus is seen as God, but Jesus himself would say at the time, why do you call me good? Only God is good. He kept pointing and talking about God, God, God. He, even when he said, the Father and I are one, uh, that has been interpreted that Jesus is God. But, but Jesus says in A Course in Miracles, the Father and I are one has two parts and the one part is greater. The, the Father is the Creator, and the I is the Christ. And it's not that one is better or worse than the other, it's just that one is the Creator and one is the creation. And that's what he meant by the Father and I are one. He wasn't saying, I'm God. In A Course in Miracles, he even says things like, don't worship me, 
because you might think of me as your elder brother. He's, he's referring to himself still as Jesus as like an elder brother to get away from this worship idea that, that somehow a brother should be worshipped. He's saying basically only God is, should be held in awe or should be held in a state of worshipful adoration. Only God, because God is the, the Creator. And that's like when you do work with Apollo, you know, it's still, it's God, it's all pointing back to, to God. And, and that's taking it away from this idea of separate persons, separate places, separate heroes. Even Jesus pokes fun at uh, the body, where he calls the body the hero of the dream. And he says it's the, the serial adventures of the body, which is what the, is the hero's journey in terms of form. But he's not telling us to, to emphasize that. He's telling us to be willing to question it and let that go. He's asking us to see the world in holistic terms instead of fragmented terms. He's asking us to realize that, that when we accept the correction, it's the correction for all of the seeming fissures, all of the seeming different situations. He's, he's saying there's only one situation going on and the Holy Spirit sees it that way and it's healed. It's healed as a unified situation, it's not healed through bits and pieces, in, in fragments. So when we search for a solution to an interpersonal relationship, the world would say, you have to find it in the acting out of that interpersonal relationship. Jesus would say, if you see the world differently, then you bring healing to everything and everyone, because everything and everyone is, is part of your mind. You see it. You see the world holistically, you don't see the world in terms of fragments. That's how Beautiful. not to see the air. Yeah. yeah. Okay, trip done. <laughs> First session. Yes. Thank you for coming, everyone. <laughs>